بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد خير الاولين والاخرين وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to the Zaytuna College Ramadan series. Uh, I'm Dr. Abdullah bin Hamid Ali, Associate Professor of Islamic Law and Prophetic Tradition here at Zaytuna College. And today, the topic we want to speak about is the concept of taqwa. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verses 183 and 187, he begins a discussion of the topic of fasting. And in verse 183, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he begins by saying, Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, kutiba alaykum usiyam, kama kutiba alayladina min qablikum, laallakum tattakun. O you who believe, fasting has been ordained for you, just as it was ordained for those that came before you, in order that you achieve taqwa. And at the end of verse 187, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, Allah ayatihi nasi, and thus does God give clarity to his signs for humanity in order that they achieve taqwa. And so we notice here that the first verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks of what we can call a goal of fasting, which is the achievement of taqwa. But then he ends those verses as well, saying that he's clarified these verses and these injunctions in order that uh, the people all shall achieve taqwa. Now, the word taqwa has many translations in the English language. Uh, it's very difficult to find an accurate synonym uh, where there's one-to-one correspondence. But sometimes taqwa is translated as fear. Sometimes you may see it translated as um, dutifulness to God or God consciousness, sometimes reverence for God, uh, or, or even piety, or even piety. Um, I, in particular, want to uh, utilize the word piety to describe uh, taqwa, uh, but I want to go a little bit deeper in, in this meaning versus linguistic, and then also its use, of, uh, its use in the Quran itself. Uh, but linguistically or etymologically, the word taqwa, uh, it is uh, synonymous with what we can call a shield. Uh, it means to take a shield against things that are harmful to oneself. Or Ja'la nafsi fi wiqayatin min ma yakhaf, as uh, Imam al raqab Asfahani, he translates or he, uh, he defines it. It is to, for one to take a protection for, for, uh, for oneself against the things from which one is fearful. Right? And so in that sense, um, taqwa is meant to protect the human being uh, or and protect others as well, of course, depending on how we utilize the word. In the Quran, uh, we find that in one verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ أَهْلِكُمْ نَارًا Protect uh, yourselves and your family from a fire. Right? And uh, that itself is a cognate of the word taqwa as well. Uh, another verse uh, is uh, one where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ حَقَّ تُقَاتِهِ وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ O oh, you who believe, have taqwa for Allah to the extent that he deserves. Uh, and so the companion Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu an, when commenting on this particular verse, he said that what, this, what it means for you to have taqwa for Allah to the extent that he deserves is for Allah to never be disobeyed, for him never to be shown ingratitude, and for him to never to uh, be forgotten. Now, uh, the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet, when they heard this, they knew, uh, they felt uneasy about it because they knew it was an impossible task for them to never disobey or to never forget God or to never show ingratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for that reason, another verse was revealed which says, مستطعتم, So have taqwa for Allah to the extent of your capacity. So if we reflect upon, uh, first and foremost, this idea that's taqwa being a shield, uh, against harm, uh, the particular harms we're most concerned about are harms in the hereafter. And for that particular reason, this is why uh, some scholars, they add to the definition, it is for one to protect oneself, مِمَّا يُدُرُّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ You know, sort of, we call it nafsi مِمَّا يُدُرُّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ uh, It's for one to uh, protect and guard the self from the things which will harm oneself in, in the hereafter, right? Uh, and so the reality of taqwa is that it is a combination of compliance to commands with God and avoidance of prohibitions. You now, people generally are, we would say, a person is as pious as one is um, 
capable of suppressing one's passions and one's desires, right? So there is an internal aspect to piety or taqwa, but also an, ex- an, an external uh, aspect to piety. Yeah, so one fulfills God's commandments. Those things can be compulsory, of course. And then, of course, there can be recommendations on top of that, but also you avoid God's prohibitions. You know, so and among uh, the um, uh, the prohibitions um, are things which uh, are harmful to the body and then harmful to the soul as well. And of course, things that are things uh, uh, matters of compliance or commandments, uh, things that are beneficial to the soul, as we know. Uh, and so, the human being has been given seven limbs of the body, and so our spiritual tradition teaches us that um, that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has provided the human being with both um, commandments and prohibitions with respect to uh, these seven parts of the body, you know, the eyes, the ears, the tongue, uh, the stomach, the feet, and the genitals, right? So naturally, you, your eyes should only gaze upon things that are pleasing to God. Uh, one should, of course, naturally not be watching things that are uh, harmful to the soul or harmful to the brain. And of course, many of us can think about so many different things in that particular regard. Uh, many of you know what you do. Uh, and we ask, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you the strength to overcome your vice. Uh, but the eye should not only gaze, should not, or should only gaze upon things that are pleasing to God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ears should only listen to things that are useful and beneficial. Uh, and now, of course, the eyes are a pathway to the heart. Uh, so you see things and they leave an impression upon uh, the heart and then uh, you remember them and they become the source of some type of passion in the future. You know, they, 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 they recall them and then you want those things and then you indulge in those things and then you can become uh, harmed by those things. You know, so the eyes, you have the ears and the tongue. And of course, naturally, we want to watch our tongues, only speak good. Uh, we don't utilize, we only utilize our feet to walk to places uh, or to do things with them which are good and, and beneficial to the soul. Our hands as well, the same thing. We don't put our hands on people or, or utilize them uh, to touch uh, and hurt uh, others. And then also we are um, people of chastity, that we protect and guard our genitals, that we only um, gratify ourselves, uh, our sexual passion with our spouses, um, uh, those who are lawful to us in marriage, uh, and then, of course, the stomach, we only eat things that are halal, things that are lawful to eat. We don't indulge in things or eat things that are uh, unlawful to eat. And, of course, we could potentially add to that things that are we try our best to avoid things that are harmful to our bodies as well. Right. So taqwa is connected with all of these seven um, parts of the body. But then if we add the heart, then there's another element here, which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he wants the human being's heart to conform with the guidance of of, of the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, and of course, naturally, the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we know the famous hadith where the Prophet said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يكون هواه تبعا لما جئت به That none of, none of you truly believes until um, his uh, desire or his whim, his fancy, is in conformity with what I have brought. So, the heart is extremely important, too. And so this is what I mean uh, when, when I say that there's an internal aspect of piety as well, internal aspect of taqwa, you know, because an individual, we should not look down upon people. We should not envy people. We should not, uh, you know, resent people as well, right? So, so there's a way to control uh, these things. And so when we reflect deeper upon taqwa, I think you perhaps realize that taqwa although a noun is, uh, is a bit of an action word in the sense that you can't be characterized as being pious unless you are involved in some type of activity which is indicative of piety. Either you're avoiding something or you are fulfilling a commandment. You know, you can't claim that, well, my heart's in the right place uh, if you're not doing anything, right? But then I want to make, uh, I think it's important to make a distinction between what we call um, a good act or a pious act and the virtue. This is extremely important because the Quran, while on one hand we can say that fasting or the fast of Ramadan, uh, the the goal or the reason that Muslims, they fast a month of Ramadan is because it is a pillar of Islam. We are fulfilling an obligation. That's one thing uh, we can say about it. However, 
in verse 183 of Surah 2, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fundamentally begins by speaking about fasting in general. He doesn't say that the fast of Ramadan has been ordained, ordained for you, you know, but he said fasting itself has been ordained or prescribed for you. And, but, but the reason is it has been prescribed is la'allakum tattaqun, in order that you achieve piety or in order that you achieve taqwa. In other words, to say that fasting is a tool uh, whose end is uh, the avoidance of sin and the fulfillment of God's commandments. But more important than simply fulfilling the commandment and avoiding the sin is for one to reach a state where the individual wants to do good things, even when they don't have the opportunity and to, and to want to not do something, do things that are bad, even when you have the opportunity to, th to do things bad. And this is what we can say is a fundamental difference between a good act and a virtue and a bad act and a vice, right? Because, because a vice is not simply you doing something bad, right? You can fall into sin out of weakness, right? You know, any of us can fall into sin out of weakness. You just, put yourself in the wrong situation, right? However, um, to have vice is fundamentally to want to do something evil, and you're just simply waiting for the opportunity to do so, right? And, and that's not a good state to be in. So Islam seeks to actually to condition the heart in such a way that uh, the human being is actually constantly progressing towards goodness, and fasting is a is a very... Uh, uh, the best way to do that, you know, so this is fundamentally what these verses of the Quran are telling us to do in this particular regard. Now, there's another thing to reflect upon to think about in the Quran in that, that the Quran begins in the first surah of the Quran, Al-Fatiha. And also Al-Fatiha, one of the names of Al-Fatiha is Al-Waqiyah, which is also a cognate of, of the word of Taqwa, which means the protector, right? The Fatiha is the protector, right? But in Al-Fatiha, the first prayer that we find in Al-Fatiha is a prayer for guidance, right? It's a prayer for guidance. But then the final surah of the Quran, surah 114, surah Tanaz, it ends with a prayer for protection, right? So what is interesting is that in surah 2 of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins that surah by answering that first prayer, by saying, that kitab la fihi hudallil muttaqin, that, that this is the book, wherein there is no doubt uh, a guidance for the muttaqin, the people of taqwa, the people who are pious or the pious people, right? So in other words, you know, we say, Dina salat al-mustaqim, then God says, this is your guidance, follow the book itself. Your guidance has come. Dina salat al-mustaqim, dhalika tidab la riba fihi hudallil muttaqin. But he also qualifies it and says that, that the guidance is for the muttaqin. In other words, to say that, there are many people who shall read this book, but they don't receive, uh, uh, receive any guidance, right? And later in the Quran, Allah actually says, And we reveal from the Quran what is a cure and a mercy for the believers, but it only increases the wrongdoers in ruin, right? So in other words, the Quran could be a source of misguidance if you are not a person of taqwa, right? So taqwa... Uh, uh, or the people of taqwa are those who truly take benefit from the book, right? Even though the book is intended to be for all, human, all for hum humanity, and this is uh, what's mentioned in the verses related to Ramadan, that shahru Ramadan lilladhi unzira fihu Qur'anuhu dallin nasi, that it is the month of Ramadan wherein the Qur'an was revealed as guidance to all humanity. But ultimately, it is the muttaqi, the individual who has taqwa, who truly benefits from the from the Quran? So, in other words, to say that uh, God is guiding us through the Quran, and in the Quran, the Quran tells us that we should fast, and then Allah tells us that fasting shall give you taqwa, right? And we know that a condition for guidance or proper guidance is to have taqwa, right? So we can achieve that through fasting. It's not only in the month of Ramadan, but in general, right? And in general, the month of Ramadan. So it begins with guidance, it ends with protection. And of course, if we have taqwa, then we shall have protection too at the same time, right? So, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is answering this for us. But then there's another element to reflect upon too, is that the human being uh, lives in a world of both material and immaterial, 
that the human being himself is both material and immaterial, right? And that we have a soul, the human being, the human soul is immaterial, meaning that we're not able to detect where exactly it, it actually exists. What part of the body, right, is the soul to be found? And this is something, of course, for the ages has been, has been debated, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the nor of the seen and the unseen. He, he talks about in the Quran, there's alim al ghaybi wa shahada, the world of the unseen and the world of the seen, or mulk wal malakut. Um, he talks about this. And, and the human being, no human being comes into this world with the ability to fulfill all of his needs. You know, every human being is helped by some other human being, right? And so uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, fundamentally tells us that, okay, while we have a, a many different um, responsibilities as human beings, that we cannot fulfill those, those responsibilities without the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reveals the Quran. He sends us messengers to remind us of our, our duties and help us to fully develop and to mature into the creatures that Allah ultimately wants us to become. And, and so, so in the Quran, in Surah Al-Anfal, for instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he talks about taqwa in a different way. And he says, Ya amanu in yaj'alakum furqana. Uh, oh, you who believe, uh, if you have taqwa for Allah, if you fear God, if you revere God, then Allah, he shall make for you a criterion, right? which is really interesting because Allah in the verses of Surah, Surah, uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, when he speaks about the month of Ramadan, he mentions, of course, it is nas min al huda wal furqan, that he sent uh, the, the Quran as guidance to, for all humanity, uh, clarifications, uh, of the guidance and the criterion, right? In other words, an external criterion uh, to know what is good and what is evil, right? But then he says that if you have taqwa for Allah, that he will give you a criterion, as if to say there are two criterions. So there's in that criterion for the material realm, uh, but there's also a criterion for the immaterial in the sense that the human being will be given a type of faculty, right? When you practice piety, uh, by which you are able to discern certain things right, that most people are unable to, to discern if they themselves are not committed to piety. At least this is, we can say this is a claim of the Quran. Um, Raghba Asfahani says that the human being has been fundamentally pla been placed on the earth for three basic reasons. One is what he calls imaratil arth, in order to cultivate the earth, right? To, to build upon the earth, to cultivate the earth, to, to uh, extract the benefits and uh, the benefits of the earth in order to share them with true creation. The second reason that he's been created is li'ibadatillah, is for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and all of us have heard this before. And then thirdly, li'khilafatillah, it is for stewardship, to act as God's trustee on the earth, to, to be the overseer of all the other creatures on the planet. And then he goes further and says that, that the individual who does not have the right qualities is not fit to be the Khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And among those qualities, and most important of them is taqwa. Uh, and so, and another beautiful thing we say about taqwa, as we move closer to our conclusion, is that, that while on one hand, we can, and we do generally judge people as being pious by what we observe from them. The reality of taqwa is internal in the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only knows who's truly sincere, right? So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, a taqwa ha huna, that taqwa is here. He pointed to his chest three different times and said that, you know, that's where the heart is. Because naturally, don't, we don't want people to arrogate themselves above, above other people. And so we've been taught this, this by the Quran, Allah inna akramakum inda Allahi isqaqum, the most noble of you in the side of, side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are those who are most pious, those who are the most God conscious, those who revere God the most, right? And in another verse, فَلَاتُ زَكُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنَ التَّقَى Do not ascribe piety to yourselves, because he knows best those who are people of taqwa. So in this sense, uh, taqwa it is a, we can say that it is a spiritual tool or faculty required to complete our journey, our journey back home, right? And, and by our journey back home, what I mean by that is that Jannah, 
paradise is the true home of the human being, that our parents were created to live there, and we've been created to live there, and they were cast down onto the earth as a source uh, or a time for them to redeem themselves and for the rest of us to redeem ourselves. And while we are here, we are preparing, hopefully preparing our home, enhancing and expanding our estates there in Jannah. To, so once we transition from this world into the other world, we'll return to a, a better home than the one uh, our parents left when they were cast out um, millennia ago. But, but taqwa also is a, we say, is a, in a, a particular trust layer to all human relationships, right? In other words, without taqwa, without piety, without commitment to truth and honesty, without commitment to justice, then society will fall apart. That, that taqwa or, or piety is important with respect to the relationship between parents and children, right? You know, you tell your child something and you say you're going to do it and then you don't do it, they lose trust in you. They say, well, mom is always, or dad is always breaking their promise, right? So taqwa, if you believe in Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, you believe that you're held responsible for what you say and for what you do, then you will do it, right? And then itself, the, an additional benefit is that, okay, it spreads trust, right? It's trust also between spouses. Uh, you make a, an agreement in your contract prior to your marriage, and you honor that agreement. Why? Because you have taqwa. Uh, the relationship between governments and citizens, the same thing, you know, that we don't, if we don't have in public office people of taqwa, people who believe in God and people who believe in a reckoning in the hereafter, right, then those people will lie to us. Those people will manipulate us. They will take advantage of us. They will oppress us. They will tyrannize us, right? And the same thing between the relationship between corporations and between consumers, it's the same thing, that taqwa, we, we want to have a society, a virtuous city, we would say, right, where individuals relate to one another and they share a sense of obligation towards one another and also uh, an obligation uh, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So where would we be without taqwa? Uh, piety is a source of lasting peace. Uh, and so hopefully this was a, a good introduction to the understanding of taqwa. Uh, of course, there are many other things that can be said about it and the different ways that it's utilized in the Quran. But fundamentally, it is uh, a word which means protection or a shield. An individual takes on taqwa as a shield from the harm that shall come to oneself and the hereafter. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he bless you, us all with taqwa. We ask him that he grant you a blessed and a very beneficial Ramadan. This is Dr. Abdullah bin Hamid Ali from Zaytuna College here asking you to continue your support of Zaytuna College. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he also supports you and bless you. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.